Okay, here's a funny little limerick. There was a faith healer of Beale who said, although pain is not real, when the point of a pin goes into my skin, I hate what I don't think I feel. <laughs> so what happens when you're going through a difficult time, a troubled time, a time of change? Change. I love it. Bring it on, bring it on, bring it on. Together, change. I love it. Bring it on, bring it on, bring it on. And every change is simply a change in form. It's not a change in essence. The essence is always the same. Energy is impersonal. Energy is neutral. It's neither good nor bad. It just is. So, Matisse was painting watercolors, and Picasso was watching him. And Matisse was not intimidated by Picasso. So he was painting, and all of a sudden he splattered some paint accidentally. And Picasso said, oh no, you made a mistake. He said, oh no, I'm just going to turn it into a flower. Now look into your life and ask yourself, what can you turn into a flower? What in your life can you change into a flower? What, what, what circumstance, what appearance, what, what diagnosis, what bank balance, what relationship can you turn into a flower? I'm just going to turn it into a flower. Together, I'm just going to turn it into a flower. But there are four things we're talking about today that are important in doing that. And the first is embracing. Embracing, observing, um, releasing, and lifting up. Embracing. Embracing. How do you embrace that which is seemingly negative in your life? How do you embrace it? How do you turn it into a flower? You know, I once was in a church and uh, I was at a board meeting. I just got, you know, I was just there. I was new. And there were a church where... Um, some of the things I was teaching were new, even though I was born and raised in Unity, for some reason it was new. And uh, we were doing our check-in in, in our, uh, in our, uh, our uh, board meeting, and in our check-in, uh, it was my turn, and, and there were some things going on, and I said, um, right now, I'm just uh, embracing some limitations. And they said, embracing some limitations? One woman said, Limitations? Young man, you don't have any limitations. And I, I thought to myself, ah. Oh. And they said, well, but in order to let go of my limitations, I have to embrace them first. It's called in um, Byron Katie's book, Loving What Is. It doesn't mean that you wallow in it. It doesn't mean that you're stuck in it. It doesn't mean that you uh, allow it to continue indefinitely. It means that in order to make the form change, in order to turn it into a flower, you've got to embrace it. You've got to accept that it is exactly where it is in consciousness, that you are exactly where you are in consciousness, and then you can do something with it. And what could you do with it? I don't know. What could you do with it? Hmm. Maybe you could observe it. Maybe that's the first step. How do you observe that negative something? How do you watch that negative something? You know, I found... I found many years ago that one of the things that sometimes caused me to give my best talks was that just before the talk, something weird happened. <laughs> now, sometimes it would also cause me to give my worst talks, depending on me. So something happened, you know, and then I'm all resistant, and it can't, it's can't be. It just can't be. I'm not going to ask you to affirm it with me. <laughs> it just can't be and I would go in in a state of resistance and it would, you know, and things would just be all clunky. Or I could go, hmm, that's interesting and embrace it. Not think it's going to go on forever, not be unwilling to confront it or deal with it or face the situation or do something about it. I remember, oh, this just comes to my mind. My very first church, I came home one afternoon. I was single and I crawled into bed, and I pulled up the covers, and I was exhausted. And I had the presence of mind to ask, why am I so exhausted? Because I'd had plenty of sleep. And it was, make a list, came to me, make a list of everything that went wrong today. I made a list. There were 37 things. And they only had one service. <laughs> and I had 37 things that had not gone the way I wanted them to that day. All right. Now, put a check mark next to the things that you can do something about. Oh. And so I checked six things. Now, cross off the other 31. <laughs> I crossed off the 31. Now, write down next to the six 
what you're going to do about it. Okay, I'll talk to this, then I'll move this, and I'll do this. And guess what? I turned it into a flower. I had energy. I got up. I got out of bed. I got on my bicycle. I had a great time. What are you going to turn into a flower? Do you take the time every day to turn it into a flower? Do you take the time every day to go outside? Oh, how many of you are looking forward to winter? Raise your hand. Yay. There's three of us. Okay. What do you do when you're in that time of the year where there's less light, where there's less able to go outside? Make a concerted effort to get involved in the light. I get involved in the light. Together? I get involved in the light and I let the light move me. Together? And I let the light move me and the light never goes away. Together? And the light never goes away. So, well, there's fewer hours of light. It's all right. Turn it into a flower. Make sure. I spend a half hour every day. I call it exercising. I call it walking the dog. I call it whatever I call it, but it's being in the light. I go outside. Now, you may not want to do that, but you might want to sit by the window covered up and bundled up, <coughs> reading your book or whatever you're doing, but be in the light. Let that light move you. Physiologically, psychologically, it moves you to be in the light. And if you're not in the light, well, it makes a difference, and they've done all kinds of studies I won't bore you with. But another study that I saw said also that the smell of the dirt, actually specifically the bacteria in the dirt, get into your brain and change your mood equal to the most strong antidepressant. I know it sounds weird, but I read it. It must be true. So, but seriously, what is that? It seriously, it moves you. Any, how many of you are gardeners? Raise your hand. You know what I'm talking about. You could be in the most poor mood, and you go out there, and it's, it changes you. I'm, I'm saying to embrace what is, and then move with it creatively. It does not have to limit you, but you need to embrace the limitation in order to move past it. Becoming the observer of the false persona of the limited self. Okay, let's, there's a lot of words there. <laughs> Become the observer of the false persona of the limited self. What is the false persona? The word persona, I believe it's Latin. It, comes, it means um, mask. It's the mask. You know, you ever see the, 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 the happy, sad mask? What do they call those in, in drama? Theater. Theater mask. Comedy and tragedy. Yeah, yeah, comedy and tragedy. Those were called the persona. They're the masks that the actors would wear. And you are the actor in your play, and you can look at yourself observing the false persona of your limited self, the mask, and what happens? How, do you, how can you observe the mask of your limited self? you got to take it off first to look at it. So there's a separation between you and that false persona, and then you can say, oh, there's the happy face, there's the sad face, there's... And I even find it helpful, and this may be way too weird for you, so ignore me if it is, but it's helpful for me to go, it's feeling rather special today. It's feeling scared. It thinks it's separate from everybody else. It's, uh, it's intimidated. It's very angry right now. It's whatever it is. Now, what am I doing there? Something is doing the looking. Something's doing the observing. What is that something that's doing the observing, that's looking at the persona, the false mask of the limited self? I am that I am has sent me. That's the I am self, that's the I am presence, that's the spiritual essence, that's the spiritual nature, that's the who that you are inside. And by observing, by first embracing, yep, that's what's going on. And then observing, you move into a new perspective. And you stop fighting these things. You also understand that they're only there to heal me. They're only there to bless me. This is only there to heal me. Together. This is only there to heal me. This is only there to bless me. This is only there to bless me. And I, was, I once had a person that was just really tough. And I learned so much from that person. And what I mostly learned was how to heal my soul. And I remember it came to me, whenever you're sitting with this person, because I had to have meetings with this person, I am using Sam, not the name, I am using Sam to heal my soul. I am using you to heal my soul, mentally. And it was constantly using it. I'm going to use it to heal my soul. Now, 
How do you use Sam, you know who Sam is in your world, to heal your soul? How many of you ever went to the dentist or had a dentist, I haven't for years, but they may still do it, who gave you a tablet that was dark red and you're supposed to put it in your mouth and before you brush your teeth, let it dissolve and it shows you because it turns all the plaque in your mouth red. You know what I'm talking about? And raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. If you don't ask that person, they'll tell you. <laughs> It would, then you see, what do you see? You see where you need to brush. Thank you, Sam, for showing me where I need to brush. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, thank you, circumstance, for showing me what I need to brush. Thank you, diagnosis, for showing me what I need to work on. Not getting all caught up in it, but seeing it as the persona, the mask of the false self. It's... It's just there to show me what I need to see. And everything then becomes in service to something higher. And what is that something higher? The spiritual growth that we're all looking for, that we're here for. That's the whole reason why we're here. It's the only reason why we're here is to grow spiritually. We're not here to get what we want, although getting what you want sometimes happens. We're not here to be comfortable, although being comforted is a very good thing. Jesus called the Holy Spirit the Comforter. All those things are good, but he said, seek first the kingdom. The kingdom is of growth. The kingdom is of consciousness. The kingdom is of unfoldment. And he used a lot of interesting metaphors for it. He said it was like a little seed that turns into a big plant. He said it was like investing money. He used that metaphor a lot, taking a little bit and turning into something more. It was always about growth and change and movement and change. I love it. Bring it on, bring it on, bring it on together. Change. I love it. Bring it on, bring it on, bring it on. And how did we in our culture get from that to heaven being a place that you go and you die and play a harp bored out of your mind, streets paved with gold, and it's an outcome. No, heaven is a choice, not an outcome. Heaven is a choice, not an outcome. It's a decision that you make, not a place you go. And where you go is determined by the decision that you make. So it's the desire. Remember last week we talked about the desire. Well, the desire is going to bring up everything unlike itself. As the light comes in more and more and more, something happens. When I was at Unity Village, I first moved there, and then the spring came. And it was my first experience in my life of a coldish environment. Now that I'm in Chicago, I call it a coldish environment. Because <laughs> it was about 10, 15 degrees warmer than here. But I'd never seen... Places where bodies of water froze. But then the spring came, and it started warming up more and more and more. And they got their water from an unfiltered treatment, or non-treatment plant. And what would happen was, where they got the water from was from a small lake, almost a pond. And I lived there, and one day I turned on the tap water, and out came this brown guck. And I went to somebody, I said, what's going on? And they said, oh, the lake's turned. And uh, I said, well, what am I supposed to do? Buy bottled water for about three days, and then when the lake's finished turning, then you can go back to drinking. Th I thought, ooh. <laughs> and I found out what happens, though. Sunlight comes in, warms up the cold water until it reaches critical mass, and then there's a turning. In your consciousness, the light that you bring in sometimes brings about a turning. And what do you do? Well, you embrace it, you observe it, you release it, and you lift up. And what do you do when you, when you, when you see the bread die and when you brush it? What do you do when you have a splot? You turn it into a flower. You've got to do something with it, but the first thing you have to do is to embrace it. Okay, this is what is not finding it, then observe it, become the observer of the false persona, and then what? Well, you've got to release it. You know, I shared some things about Jason, about uh, something that I did in the car uh, about uh, letting go of a limitation. I don't even remember what it was because it was just in the moment somebody asked me what I said and I don't even remember, but it was something. And he, he, he took it and he ran with it. Well, this week, he was uh, driving him back from Taekwondo, and uh, he noticed I was doing something with my finger. I was doing this. I had my hand on the gear shift knob, but I was doing this. And he said, what are you doing? I said, what do you mean? With your finger, what are you doing? I said, oh, and I realized what I was doing. 
I had had a thought that I didn't want to hold on to. One of those thoughts, just a goofy thought, I don't even know what it was. And I was slicing it up with my blue sword. So I was told by Jane Elizabeth Hart, the Unity licensed teacher and the head of Center for Enlightenment, she'd said, take your blue sword, the flaming sword of truth. You take your blue sword and you cut up your thought form. You, the thought form that you're holding, the negative thought. What do you do with it? Well, it's a way to accept it. You look at it, you embrace it, you observe it, and you slice it up and you release it. And so anyway, I told him that I have my blue sword. He says, oh, well, how many blue swords do you get? I said, well, you only need one. It's a metaphor. It's just a, a symbol, but it's releasing the energy. And, and I told him the energy is impersonal. It's the structure we build around the energy that we're changing. The energy is then free. Kind of like when I cross the things off my list and check the things and God help me to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can't, the wisdom know the difference. So that's what I was doing. And so I shared that with him. And sure enough, there he was. And he told Lynn all about that. Using the finger. This finger. <laughs> and cutting up the blue sword. Now, I don't know. These are little things you do in order to move your consciousness. To move into a new place. To release your old energy. To not be limited by those circumstances. Because those there's always going to be something in your life to grow through, to learn through, and you can use it all for your benefit. Now you say, but I just want to deny it. I just don't want it to be there. You know, how many unity ministers does it take to change a light bulb? That light bulb's not burned out. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so what, what can you do? But Myrtle Fillmore herself said these words, and I'm going to read them to get them right. She said, we don't tell you to deny the existence of of seeming problems or shortcomings, admit them, just don't identify yourself with them. We don't tell you to deny the existence of these things. Admit them, just don't identify yourself with them. And then, this was in a letter she wrote to somebody in the last year of her life, and she'd seen it all and done it all, and she realized some things just worked. And she said, spells of cussedness, I'll say that again, I love it, spells of cussedness are the result of the spirit of good doing a much needed house cleaning work. Spells of cussedness. Just the spirit of good doing a much needed house cleaning work. House cleaning. You're here to heal my soul. I'm using you to heal my soul. The little sign I put by my computer. This can only bless me. This can only heal me. Hmm. Moving with it. Moving with it. In unity, this is called chemicalization. You may have heard of it, or you might not have heard of it. How many of you read the book Lessons in Truth by Emily Cady? Unity published it over 100 years ago. That book, Lessons in Truth, had a chapter in it called Chemicalization that was taken out in the 1940s. The book was written in the 1890s. Why was it taken out? Because Charles Fillmore wasn't around at that point to tell them that they were ridiculous because some people thought it was negative. So it was out, and then in the 1970s, the late 1970s, I was in ministerial school with a class that was going through the things we were going through. As you bring the light in, and then the light turns in your consciousness, you have things to deal with. And as one of my classmates said, ministerial school is 20 years of spiritual growth, 30 years of emotional growth, and 2 years of hell. So, so, so here we're going through this, and somebody found the lost chapter, that chemicalization, because it was in the library there, they had old copies, and we made copies, we passed them out to everybody, and finally we turned around to each other and said, let's go to the people in charge, we said, put it back, put it back in the book, chemicalization, spiritual detoxification, what you should do, how to work through these kinds of states. It's not negative. It doesn't bring them on. It helps you to move through them. It's embracing. It's observing. It's releasing. And it's lifting up. And so we began this little campaign. And if you go buy a copy of Lessons in Truth, they put chemicalization back in because it's an important part. And, you know, it's not to be afraid of because it's... If you observe something, if you accept something and embrace it, then it can change and move. But if you resist it, it, it just stays there. So by observing it, you know, once I took a seminar many years ago, 
And the person who was running it said, does anybody in this room have a headache? And then three or four people raised their hand. And he had them each sit in the front of the room, and he asked them, um, if your headache uh, had a color, what color would it be? And they'd give a color. If your headache had a texture, what would the texture be? And they would give a texture. If your headache had a shape, what would the shape be? Would it be spiky or smooth? Or they would do that. If your headache could make a sound, what sound would it make? If your headache... It had a volume, like if you could fill it with water, how much would it be? And you just keep doing it, and in every case, they lost their headache. Why? Because they were letting it be, observing it. I said, interesting thing. He said, well, I should just deny my headache. Well, maybe it's another way of doing it. You know, denials and affirmations, there's a releasing process. Releasing that which no longer serves you by embracing it, observing it, Releasing it and then lifting it up. Lifting it up. How do you lift it up? What kind of spiritual practices do you use to lift yourself up? Do you go out in the sunlight? Do you smell the bacteria in the air that lift you up? I mean, it's very physical. Do you take the time to do the things to get yourself in circulation and move out? Do you make a list of what you can and cannot change? Checking off the ones that you can and crossing off the ones you can't. Are you willing to do something with the energy that's there, first accepting it, embracing it, and then observing it? You are the image and likeness of God. You are creative and you're designed in this lifetime to move and grow and learn and change and be. And not to stay stuck and comfortable, although comfort's part of life. Not to always get what you want, although sometimes that happens but always to move and grow and learn. And this is the time for us to do it. Usually, you know, i got all these ideas and stuff, and then all of a sudden I'm in the middle of the talk, and I think, okay, stop it, <coughs> go into meditation. So this is that time. So I trust it, and I'm just going to move us into this time of meditation. And so we're going to take something in our life, and we're going to just go through these different stages. Set aside the pages in your hand so you have your fingers open, your heart open, your mind open, you're open at the top, on all sides, in your heart. Become aware of the seat underneath you and the feeling of the air upon your skin and your breathing. And then just embrace that which is. If something surfaces, just embrace it. This is what is right now. And by accepting it, I rob it of any power to harm me. Nothing can harm me because I am. I am that I am. And step back for a moment from whatever this is and observe it. And observe yourself. What is it feeling? What is it thinking? What is it wanting? What is it doing, observe the false persona of the limited self with curiosity, not judgment, interest, not condemnation. And now just imagine you're taking that wonderful flaming blue sword and slicing it up, not in a negative way, just breaking up the old thought form and releasing the energy and freeing yourself up. And now lift up into a new awareness, a new light, a new life. And let yourself be. Thank you, God, that we move into this consciousness. We move with it that we turn it into a flower, that we move with the energy that is unleashed and unlocked as we embrace, observe, release, and lift up. And so it is. Amen. Uh, one more thing. One more thing. It's called the agitated energy process. We've got it outside the fellowship hall. And it's just a journaling exercise that you can use to answer the questions, to get in touch with what am I feeling,
put false beliefs behind the feeling, what true belief would calm me, and then just keep doing that until you feel calm. You can release a lot of energy this way as well. There's a lot of little things you can do. But one thing that doesn't work is to pretend like it's not happening. Moving with it, letting it be, embracing, observing, releasing, and lifting. And now take a deep breath and let it out and set aside all papers in your hands or anything that makes a rustling sound. Open your hands, open your heart, Imagine yourself open at the top, and we begin by becoming aware. Just become aware of your breathing in this now moment. Become aware of the feeling of the air upon the skin, on your face, on your hands. Become aware of the seat underneath you. And embrace everything exactly as it is. Any thoughts, any sounds, any feelings, any sensations. Just embrace. <coughs> By embracing that which is and loving it. <coughs> we let go of any resistance and we move with it. And we step back for a moment and we observe these thoughts, these feelings, these sensations, and just watch them rise and fall in our awareness. And now we release them move into deeper stillness, releasing the need to move physically and move deeper spiritually into a quiet place that's always there within us. Sometimes it helps to imagine being in the center of a diamond with glinting facets and light all around. I am my diamond heart. Moving into this light-filled center Letting everything simply be and loving it. Loving what is. Here, now, present. Embracing. Observing. Releasing. And moving deeply into the silence. up. I lift up, I lift up, and I let things be. A powerful energy is stirring within me. As I lift up into a new awareness, a new light, a new vibration, a new energy, today is I give from my unlimited self and I receive abundantly together 
I give from my unlimited self, and I receive abundantly and silently. And again aloud together. I give from my unlimited self, and I receive abundantly. And so it is. Amen.